Hey everyone, Johnny here. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at drivers and how we can use them to power our animations. When you use keyframes to animate, you're choosing a value for some property based on a given frame number. Then an interpolation or an extrapolation mode is used to determine the values when you're not on a keyframe. But what do you do when you want to base a value off something else other than just a frame number? That's when you can use a driver. To learn about drivers, we're going to take a look at a file I've put together. I've made this simple little robot arm. Let's take a look at the parts. The parts of this model are simple enough. There's an upper arm, a lower arm, and then this cannon piece. I'm kind of going with a Mega Man feel. Now the actual assembly of these parts is pretty simple. First I'm taking the upper arm, the lower arm, and then the cannon. For this model, I'm going to parent the lower arm to the upper arm using Control p and then the cannon I'll parent to the lower arm using the same method. Now we can animate this using forward kinematics. We'll move each joint and the joints that are under it in the hierarchy will move with it. So if I rotate the upper arm, all three pieces move, the lower arm, just the lower arm and the cannon, and then the cannon by itself. The idea being that the cannon will slide back and forth along the lower arm. Another thing I'm gonna do, just for fun, is add something for the cannon to shoot. So I'll add a sphere, put it in the cannon, and then I'm gonna use an object constraint to tie the ball to the cannon. With the ball selected, I'll go to constraints, and add a child of constraint. I'll point the target to the cannon. Now when the cannon moves, the ball moves with it. What's nice about this constraint is that it has this influence slider. So later on, I can set the influence to zero, and the movement of the arm and cannon no longer control this ball. Next, I can add some simple animation keyframes to this arm. I'm gonna make this animation a little shorter. Let's say we put it at 105 frames. Now using auto keying, I can add a simple animation. I'm gonna start with my upper arm, and at frame one, this seems like a good position. So I'll hit R to rotate, move it just a little, and click. You'll notice I've added a keyframe. I'll move ahead a little bit, I want it to move backwards, and you'll see it automatically keyframes. Then here, I'll move it forward. Now let's go back with our lower arm. I'm also gonna change this influence back to one just to get this out of the way for now. So now when I play this, I've got something that's looking like that. Finally, let's add some motion to our cannon. Pull it back. I want it to slide backwards on the Z axis. Start moving forward until it reaches this point. Let's play that and see what we've got. Now that we've got this put together, I'm going to switch to where I've cleaned up this animation. Now, you can see with this animation, that I've smoothed it out a bit, and I've got it to where I want it. But I want to add some secondary motion to the cannon. I want it to rotate as it moves forward and backwards. Now I could hand keyframe this movement, but if I were going to animate this several times in a longer animation, I'd want the exact same rotations to happen each time. That's going to be a hassle, especially if I had several things dependent on this motion. This is where drivers come in. A driver is a way to control one value with another. So let's figure out what we want to control. Going to my object, under viewport display, I've enabled axis. This shows me the local axis of my cannon. We can see that it moves along the arm along its Z axis. That means we're gonna want to keyframe the Z axis of this object so that it can rotate like this. Now one thing you will find 
is when you're working with rotations, sometimes things can act in ways that you're not expecting. So one option that you may need to adjust is the XYZ rotation order. Since we're gonna be rotating this only around the Z axis, I'm gonna change this to ZXY Euler. And now you see when I rotate the Z, it moves the way we want. Unfortunately, this can take a little bit of trial and error to make sure that the rotation channel you're doing is actually getting you the effect you want. But now that I've determined that the Z is what I do want to rotate, that's the channel that I want to add a driver to. To do that, I'm gonna right click on the Z channel and say add driver. This will bring up a temporary driver window. You can bring this window back up at any time if you've gone off of it by right clicking on that driven channel and pressing edit driver. You will notice that the attribute turns purple once you drive it. In addition to a value being yellow, meaning you're on a keyframe, green, meaning that you are on a frame where you're being interpolated or extrapolated, orange, where you have a value that is out of sync with its keyframe, now you have purple, meaning that it is a driven channel. So like I said, if I wanna edit this driver, I can right click and hit edit driver. This window is good for quick edits to drivers. But unfortunately, if you mouse outside of it, it's gonna go away. Another option you can do is right clicking on a driver and saying open drivers editor. This will create a new blender window that's separate from your main blender window. If you've got multiple monitors, you could stick this on a separate monitor if you'd like. Lastly, you can change a viewport to be a driver editor window. So if I split my main display and change this to drivers, I now have a drivers window open alongside my animation window. Every driver for this object that's currently selected will be displayed here. Right now, I only have one driver, the Z Euler rotation. Now to edit this driver in the driver editor window, I need to pop open the end panel and choose the drivers tab. Right away, you'll see that there are several types of drivers. Four of them explicitly use input variables. That's the averaged value, the sum values, minimum value, and maximum value. The fifth item is scripted expression, and we'll talk about that in a moment. For the types that use input variables, let's say sum of values, we need to define one or more separate input variables. The type of input variable is controlled by this drop-down button. You have single property, transform channel, rotational difference, and distance. Transform channel lets you very easily select a location, rotation, or scale channel from any object. So for instance, if I choose transform channel, use the object picker to pick the lower arm and and then choose the type as the Y rotation in its local space. Now you'll see when I rotate the lower arm, the cannon rotates with it. If I were to add a second input variable and choose the upper arm, transform channel, Y rotation, local space. Now it's using the combined rotation of these two items to drive the rotation. So these four driver types sum, average, minimum, and maximum work on a combination of these input variables. You'll get the average of the variables, the sum of the variables, the variable that's the smallest, and then the variable that's the largest. Another thing you can do is choose a single property. Say for some reason you wanted to use the metallic value of the lower arm as the rotation for the cannon. If you come to metallic, right click, and say copy as new driver, then go to the cannon, and here, under the variables, say paste driver variables, you'll see that you get that value's information pasted in. Another thing you can do here is the rotational difference. In this case, you'll choose two objects, and it will calculate the rotational difference between those two objects, and stick them into this variable here. You can rename these variables to anything you want. By default, they're called var, var001, var002, etc., but you can call them something else if you like, like angle. And you'll see here, as I change this rotation, the value changes here. And this value 
becomes your driver value. The last type of driver is scripted expression. With scripted expressions, you can write a short Python expression in the box and it will be evaluated. If we wanted to take the rotation of the lower arm, we would add an input variable of the transform channel, choosing the lower arm, choosing its Y rotation in local space. Now here under expression, we would use the name var, and then we can do something with this. If we just put this as var, it's going to exactly put the value from that variable, and that's gonna become the value of our driver. However, we could do something like var times 10. Now you'll notice when we rotate the arm, it spins much faster. Because this is a Python expression, we can do some other mathematical things, like the sine value of var times 10. And because a sine value oscillates, you see now we have an oscillating rotation. We want to base the rotation of the cannon on its position along the lower arm. So we're going to add an input variable based off a transform channel. We're going to use the cannon itself as the source. Again, you may need to do some experimentation to get the exact type and space that you're looking for. In this case, I'm going to go with my X location in local space. You'll notice as I move the object back and forth along the arm, it is spinning. And when I click, the driver value updates. Now when we play the animation, you'll see that it's a little twitchy. And the reason for that is when you're altering an object based on itself, there is a little bit better way to do this. We're going to say use self here under expressions, and we're going to change the expression to self.location.x. This is going to get the x channel of the location of the object itself without using a variable. Now when we play this, we get a very smooth animation. That's just one of those tricky things. Now we do want some more artistic control over this motion. So in the driver window, I'm going to click on this Z Euler rotation in the sidebar. I'm going to click on view and I'm going to say frame selected. Then I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So the line we see here is actually an F curve. We might be tempted to think that this is a value on the vertical and frames on the horizontal like every other F curve we've seen. Instead, the horizontal value here is the value generated by our driver. And then the vertical line is the value that will be propagated to the channel. That means right now, if my value is one, a value of about 57 is being sent to the channel. By default, there is a one-to-one -one linear relationship between the driver and its result. So any value your driver comes up with is the same value that will go to your object. However, you're saying, well, this is set up at a value of one becomes 57-ish degrees. But don't let that confuse you. The input value here is in radians, but the output value for Euler rotations is in degrees. So this is doing an automatic conversion of one radian to degrees and one radian is equal to 57.29 degrees. So it kind of looks like a one to 57 degree ratio, but it's actually just one to one, but we're converting from radians to degrees. Now, if I click on one of these control points, I can move it and make this line as steep as I like. Making it steeper will mean that a value of one could now say, rotate our object 200 degrees or I could bring it down and say moving it one only moves it 25 degrees. If I grab one of the control handles on either side of a control point and move it, I can bend this curve, meaning that for values from zero to about 0.75, my value will increase. And then as my value gets larger than that, the output value will decrease. If you wanna add additional control points to your curve, you can control right click on the curve so say I wanted to add a control point here, I could press control, 
right click, and now I have a new control point. One last thing to notice are these white dotted lines with this little box. This is the current value of our driver. Say I move the arm backwards in this frame, you'll see the driver updates with its new information. This is really helpful. Say I'm here in my animation. This shows me where I'm at in my driver. So right here in my animation, I want these to be rotated basically flat. I'm gonna change this to no auto snap just so I have a little more freedom here in my driver's editor window. I'm gonna move my control point so it's flat here. I'm gonna add another control point and bring it over here. And I'm gonna move my animation forward a little bit. As you can see, as the cannon moves forward, the value along the horizontal starts to move in that direction as well. Now, once I pass this point, moving along the arm, my curve here starts moving upwards, so my cannon will start to rotate. You see here that it only rotated a little bit. I want this to rotate a whole lot more than that. So I'm gonna add, grab this control point and start bringing this up until it reaches the value that I want. So here, I've gone about a quarter turn. I want more. Here I've gone about a half turn, 180 degrees. So now I can scrub through this. I'm gonna click on this point and delete it with X. And I'm gonna bring this back down just a little. Let's see how this looks. So that starts to give us the movement we like. Here, I've completed the animation. In addition, I ended up multiplying this by pi, and that ended up giving me a little bit more smooth animation. Of course, this is just the beginning of what you can do with drivers. Any value that can be keyframed can also be driven. Things like colors, values, and vectors can all be driven. So here's a final render of an animation of this arm with a few little bits added to the cannon that are also being driven by its movement. I hope this intro to drivers was informative. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and give the video a thumbs up if you found it helpful. You can also follow me on Twitter at Johnny Gizmo. As always, thanks for taking time out of your day to watch my video. I hope it inspires you to do something awesome. I'll see you next time.